Here we see the title page of the great Shakespeare folio of 1623, printed about seven years after the death of William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. You see on the right there a very famous picture done by Martin Droeschout of William Shakespeare. There have been a huge number of complaints about this picture because it makes the author of these brilliant, great, perceptive, clever plays look like something of a dolt, a little bit gormless, a bit stupid, and actually very deceptive. If we look closely at it, we'll find lots of clues to the fact that this is a deceiver. We look first at that strange line by his chin, which many have said indicates that he's actually wearing a mask. If you look at this section of his jacket on the left, a very clever tailor in 1911 showed, and it's now been proven by computer analysis, that this section of his coat, his doublet, is actually the back of that section. So what we're actually seeing is his left, the front of his left arm there, and the back of his left arm there. So we're only seeing his left arm. He doesn't actually have a right arm, which means he's a left-hander. He's a left-handed writer. What does that mean? Well, if you read Artemidorus, famous book on dreams from 1606, to write with the left hand. Writing with the left hand is to make some secret circumvention, to conny catch, deceive or defame anyone. What does conny catch mean? If we go to the Oxford English Dictionary, conny catch means to cheat, trick, dupe, gull. So a conny catcher is one who dupes, a cheat, sharper, a swindler. See you wearing a black jacket there, also a sign of someone who operates in secret, according to Artemidorus. Now, on the left, you see a poem which acts as a caption to this picture and a commentary upon it. The poet writes, This figure that thou here sees put, not a very complimentary way of saying it, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut. Well, gentle in those days meant noble or high-born. Um, for it could mean it's done for him at his request, but of course Shakespeare was dead in 1623. For also means instead of, in spite of. So instead of noble Shakespeare, this figure has been put there. Quite a damning way of saying it. Then the poet goes on to talk about the engraver, Martin Droeschout, and he says, Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face? Well, he's telling us there that he has a face of brass. What does a face of brass mean? Brazen-faced. It means he is a liar, a deceiver. You remember in King Lear, What a brazen-faced varlet to deny thy knowest me, he says to his steward. So, again, we're getting confirmation that the picture there is of a fraud. And if we look at the last couple of lines, Reader, look not on this picture, but his book. So the poet's telling us to turn away from the picture. It's a, it's a picture of a deceiver. Right. So if he's a deceiver and he's not the real author, who is? Now, we can find that out by looking into the numbers of this poem. Poets in those days used to call their verses numbers, and they imbued great significance in numbers and meaning. There's a very good book I could recommend to anyone by a man called Alistair Fowler called Triumphal Forms, and he shows how poets like Shakespeare, Spencer, Sidney use numbers to impart hidden meanings to their poetry. So we can look at the numbers in this poetry and see what it all adds up to. So poems are divided into metrical feet. This figure that thou here seest put. Those are called iams. Short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. And you can see you've got four in that line. So it's called an iambic tetrameter. It was for gentle Shakespeare cut. Same there. In fact, it's the same all the way through the poem. Four iams, four metrical feet. And there are ten lines. 
So 10 times 4, that's pretty easy. It gives you the number 40. The poem is divided into 40 metrical feet. Do we have any other number? Well, the poem is entitled To the Reader, a title of exactly 11 letters. At the bottom, you see it's subscribed B.I. What does B.I. stand for? Well, you only have to turn a couple of pages on in the book to see that it's the initials of Ben Johnson, the poet who wrote it. Uh, ben Johnson, of course, is a name of nine letters long. We have 11, 9, 40. Is there any other number that's significant here that's staring us in the face? Yes, there is. Actually, if you look at the top left of the poem, you'll see an acrostic, T-W-O, 2. So we've got 11, 9, 2, and 40. What do these have in common? How do we put these together? I don't think you need an O level in maths. It's quite simple. It's 11 plus 9, two times, 11 plus 9 again, equals 40. So there's a relationship, 11 plus 9, 11 plus 9 equals 40, which gives us uh, the view, the intention perhaps, that these 11s and 9s are indicating uh, metrical feet, as they relate to the 40 metrical feet in the poem. So let's see if we've got some message hidden here. We count the 11th metrical foot is there, and 9 on from there is that one, 11 on from there is that one, and 9 on there is the last metrical foot. Do we have a message? Let's, let, let's have a look what is written here. Ver had his wit, ver writ his book. Well that's very interesting because we all know the name Veer was spelt V-E-R many times by contemporaries. Veer had his wit. Veer writ his book. What a wonderful, extraordinary message to find hidden on the very first page of Shakespeare's great folio.